No, sorry, I, I I had a little bit of car trouble here, but I just wanted to to say every to say hello to everybody and say thank you. Um, what we're going to do is post uh, the um, the slides, the PowerPoint slides on um, the uh, on on online. But I, I did want to start off by thanking everybody and then then uh, giving just a brief introduction of what CIT is and, and what the uh, Montpelier Police Department plans on doing and, and trying to implement it. Can folks still hear me? Hello? Yes. Okay, all right, great, great. Okay, so, so CIT stands for Crisis Intervention Team. Uh, so there's there's two versions or well not two versions but there's often two acronyms associated with CIT. It's the crisis intervention team and crisis intervention training. Um, so so there's two points uh, of with it. So for the or for the Montpelier Police Department, we're looking at implementing the CIT training for our officers and first responders, and then the, the actual CIT team is going to be um, it's going to be a work. Um, between all stakeholders uh, that uh, regarding mental health and mental health response. So back in the 19, well, previously and in history, um, folks who were mentally ill were institutionalized. And back in 1955, we began to see the deinstitutionalization of folks who were suffering from mental illness. Um, at that point, uh, folks came back out into the communities because we were looking as a society, we were looking more for a community treatment model rather than housing folks. Um, and unfortunately, when uh, because of lack of resources, police and first responders became the, the, the ones who were responding to folks who were going through mental health crisis. Um, with that, uh, we, we, uh, we were unnecessarily uh, incarcerating people just for being sick, just for having mental illness. And in, in, 19, in the 1980s, there was a call for service for, uh, in Memphis in which, um, in which the, uh, Memphis, uh, there was a mother and her son, her 21-year-old son, I think uh, Deshaun John, uh, Robinson was his name. He was going through a mental health crisis. Uh, he had taken a knife. Uh, mom had called for the police to come help her. The Memphis Police Department showed up on scene uh, throughout the interaction. At one point in time in the confrontation, uh, the young man had the knife. He, it was reported that he lunged at the officers and the officers shot and killed him. And then we, uh, it, again, it was, it was another, it, it, it was at that point, it was you know too much. And so NAMI, which is the National Alliance of Mental Illness, uh, pretty much said, no, we're not going to do this anymore. And they began to hold police more responsible to, uh, to, to what our response levels were going to be. So Major Sam Cochran in the Memphis Police Department um, uh, joined with NAMI, and then they created, they created uh, a, a CIT program. So Major Cochran got together with um, various stakeholders, um, community members, again, like I said, NAMI, and then they formed a CIT program. So with CIT, we had uh, officers who were being trained, again, on de-escalation, more specific training for what mental illness looked like using DSM-4. I'm sorry, at the time, it's probably DSM-2, um, but using to just understanding exactly what mental illness is, what are the potential triggers that could escalate a situation and how to move forward. So um, that's when CIT was born, referred to as the Memphis model. So, um, so what we're looking at doing right now is bringing the Memphis model to Montpelier. So we had partnered, I'm sorry, can folks still hear me? Yes. Okay. So we have partnered with Washington County State's Attorney's Office, Washington County Mental Health, um, all law enforcement uh, agencies, um, Capitol Police uh, within Washington County, all of, all of the law enforcement police departments in Washington County. And we all got together and we're, we're going to implement a, a CIT program. So what, 
the CIT training is, it's actually four, 40 hours um, where officers and first responders, dispatchers will be trained um, in, in seeing mental illness, um, how to potential ways and how to de-escalate it, um, and learning directly through like the pharmacology of treatment, uh, what resources are available, everything to that effect. But before we, as we're working on implementing that plan, we will be partnering with um, other agencies, uh, well, all the, all the community resources in the area, uh, places like Turning Point, Circle, uh, everyone, to, to do uh, sequential intercept uh, mapping, if you will. And that's going to be all of, this, all of us stakeholders will get in the room, We'll find out what our response models look like, how do we approve upon them, and what are the gaps and resources? What do we want this to look like? Um, we form a steering committee. The steering committee will be in charge of writing policies, procedures, in which law enforcement ourselves we would adhere to, and, and, and how we're gonna do this response. So as we're, we're listening, um, and, and to be honest, law enforcement wants to get away from the business of being the primary uh, agency that folks call when there's a mental health component so we want to find out what those gaps and resources are how do we bring those gaps how do we bring those community resources uh to um to folks who are in crisis so the steering committee uh we we work on the sequential intercept mapping we identify the gaps that also gives us more leverage when we're looking for federal and state level grants um and then uh, to, to form or to, uh, to fill any of the gaps that we know that we're missing. So with, with CRT training, again, it's 40 hours. We would, so, so currently in the state of Vermont, we have, um, we have uh, there, there is a mandatory uh, training on mental health and mental illness that all law enforcement officers get. The next level is team two training. Team two training is, uh, is a couple, is, is two days and it's, it's more in depth and it also brings um, families and individuals with lived experiences peers to come and to talk to law enforcement and share their experiences, whether they were good or they were bad. And the idea behind this is to develop empathy. And that's one of the things in, in my humble opinion that, that law enforcement needs to make sure we stay on top of because we have to avoid any, any ways of us versus them uh, we, we have to get rid of the, that type of thinking. So, um, so as, so, so again, so CIT is 40 hours, it's more in depth. We, we come in, we talk about, again, a baseline of what mental illness is, what it looks like, um, what are the more, what are the, what are the things that we see normally um, within our area? And, and then we bring in, again, the same thing with team two, we bring in um, peers, individuals with lived experiences. And then we also bring in folks who are um, family members. And then we have these conversations with law enforcement, with dispatchers, with firefighters and EMS. And, and again, we, we bridge these gaps together. Uh, at the end of it, it culminates into a graduation in which uh, first responders will receive a CIT pin and how it goes moving forward from there. <coughs> Officers, uh, if, if folks are experiencing a mental health crisis, again, the CIT steering committee will work on looking at other ways that we're going to respond. And, and one of the things out there is something called criteria-based dispatching. It's if someone calls 911, rather than the police automatically going to that call, how can we reroute those services? You know, if we can say, well, here's 211, or have you, can we, you know, here, here's another source to, to work on those warm handoffs um, rather than you know us automatically going to that call. So, um, so but if, if it is a crisis situation, um, then the folks on the line can request that the dispatchers send out a CIT trained officer. And the CIT trained officer will come out there and they will work to de-escalate the situation. Now, training is a crucial and it is an important part of anything that we do in law enforcement. But when we're dealing with crisis, just because an individual has training does not mean that they're going to necessarily be able to de-escalate the situation without some type of use of force. So as we, we strive to never, use use, uh, to never use force as much as we can, 
but there may be those situations in which we have to. So part of the other CIT component is how do we maintain the sanctity of life? How do we do our best to avoid using any type of trauma force? And, and, and so we need to research and continue to study ways that we can use less than lethal options. Uh, so that's another component of, of, of a CIT team, of a CIT program and platform. So um, that's uh, pretty much it in a nutshell. And again, I apologize, um, but I will, I have uh, lots of, uh, of, of slides where I have roughly about 11 slides that we're in the process of trying to get posted online. But other than that, are there any questions I can answer or, or is anyone would like to talk about uh, anything related to the CIT program to what the Montpelier Police Department wants to do um, going forward? Chief Pete, uh, I have a question. Hey, uh, very nice to hear from you again, firstly. Uh, secondly, where do you see the Montpelier Police Department in five years? Where do I see it in regards to in regards to mental health or regards to just an overall strategic plan? Overall. Overall, I, I think that um, I think that I, I inherited a very phenomenal team. Um, any chief would be fortunate and blessed to be part of this department. And uh, in coming in, I, it, it was equated to me, and, and I agree with it, that how do you take a team that's, that's uh, 14 and two and turn them into a team that's 16 and 0? So I think that uh, going forward, what we want to do is strengthen our bonds and our relationship with the community. Um, we want to bring that trust factor back because of in light of everything that's been going on within our profession, we want to, to be out there and proactively work to get that trust. So I think ultimately within the next, within five years, you will see uh, a department that is uh, the shining example of what law enforcement should be and can be, not only in the state of Vermont, but nationally. So we, we want to make sure that we're at the cusp of, of doing and exemplifying community-based policing um, and that we maintain the safety and security of, of, of our community and everyone who visits it. Thank you. So yes. what, what do you mean by zero, 16 and zero? And I guess I don't know what that means. So it's like, like if a sports team, if a sports team that they play 16 games a year, I see. And how, how you get them from 14 and two, they won 14 and lost two, to having, to winning all 16 games this season. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yes, no problem. Uh, I guess the question, can you walk me through, it's, it's not clear in my mind that let's say the police department gets a call and, you know, they're saying that there's a crisis going on. So can you take it from there and walk us through what that would look like. Okay, so currently what it looks like now is we have the uh, Montpelier Police Department has partnered with Barry City and we have partnered with Washington County Mental Health Services and actually, um, and, and we have a, a, a dedicated social worker who is working, who comes out on crisis calls. So um, sometimes, and her name is Susan, Sometimes she is uh, uh, a few days, half of the week, she's in Barrie. The other half of the week, she's in Montpelier. So we're, we're, we're trying to hone this down and perfect what this response model is going to look like. Um, but uh, so when we have a, a specific crisis call, the officers will respond. Um, we will request to see if, if Susan's available, if she's not already dealing with another, another crisis in another place. Um, we respond, work to de-escalate the situation, uh, reach out to Washington County Community Health Services and ask for mental health screeners and, uh, and see if that we can come to de-escalate the situation, find out what resources that the individual in crisis may need, what their families may need, what the potential triggers are, and, um, and then just moving forward from there. The, the whole goal is not to arrest anyone, 
uh, it's not to put hands on anyone, but again, sometimes we deal with unfortunate situations in which somebody is in a severe crisis. So if, if we find that a person is in danger to themselves or to other folks um, by state law, we may um, uh, take control and custody of them and admit them to the hospital so that they can get help. Uh, and, and again, this is, these are things that we don't want to do. Um, but, but we also, and we're looking to see if there are criminal components that aren't re as a relate aren't related directly to the mental health issue. So, um, so again, so, so that's what our current response model looks like. What we found here in Montpelier is um, we would benefit greatly because uh, Susan is, is, is overwhelmed right now. So she is, uh, so one of the things that Barry does have is, is they, they have a social worker on staff that can do follow up with folks and with families to get them the resources that they may need. Um, but we only have Susan, who is supposed to be working crisis intervention um, in response with us. So what Montpelier, I think what, what our goal is, is to see if we can find also someone else um, to do that work, to come in to do social work. But then the other questions that we need to ask are, is this the responsibility of the Montpelier Police Department? So when we when we bring the CIT program together and we and we have and we engage with the steering committee and all of our resource partners, we need to see what the bandwidth is of, that everybody what folks' resources and capabilities are, where this best might be suited for a response. So in in some communities, you have mobile crisis response teams um, that have nothing to do with the police department. That the first first ones who are called, and if there's a safety issue, then they may contact the police to help to try to deescalate the situation, or or maybe unfortunately there may be some force that may need to be applied to to get folks health and safety. Um, so we have those are those are big questions that we need to that we need to ask, but. Again, this is something that law enforcement, uh, believe it or not, has had serious concerns over for the last several decades as to why law enforcement is responding to, to crisis or calls for service in which um, there's no criminal nexus related to it. And the other part of it is also a, a, a public education component. Because right now, when folks see something that may be mental health related or something that makes them agitated or upset, um, and, you know, and, and what they see somebody else may be doing or experiencing, they're gonna, they, it appears default right to 911. 911, there's someone in the park, they're yelling, they're screaming, there's someone here, they're crying, they're, you know, is that, a, is that the best use of, of our community re resources in responding to that? Mm -hmm. So can we go back to the very beginning, like when someone calls, the dispatcher at the police, I'm assuming it would be the dispatcher at the police department. Uh, and I know, let's say I know nothing about mental illness. Someone is in the park yelling and screaming. Do they ask more question from this caller to do an assessment at that time as to, uh, you know, is this a a crisis or or what I mean is how much information they might have um, or does it automatically then get transferred to someone who's going to respond whether it's the police or Susan or well unfortunately currently so what it looks like now is that when the call comes in the dispatchers do try to get as much information as they can. Sometimes if it's a member of the public who walked by, they may not have specific information. I just saw someone in the park, they're screaming, or I just saw somebody who looks like they're crying and that they're in distress. Um, they may not have that vital information so that it would get dispatched to one of the officers and the officers would go on scene. If it's, okay. a, it, it, if it's an issue of potentially um, safety related, uh, they may, you know, they may contact another agency and the agency may say, well, that sounds like there's a safety issue. We're not gonna go out there until the scene is safe, call the police. And those are their policies. It's not necessarily the police's policy. So for example, there was, uh, I was working uh, two nights ago, we got a call um, and it was uh, of a young lady who the caller had alleged was screaming um, that she was visibly upset and that she was, um, and that she had said she was going to kill herself. So we responded to the scene. We met with the young lady. She did not appear to be emotionally upset, distressed, or anything else like that that we could that we could ascertain. She wasn't a danger to herself or danger to anyone else. 
And the only thing that she wanted to do was she wanted to get out of Montpelier and get to Burlington, but she had no way of doing that. She had no place to stay. And at that point, it's is the Montpelier Police Department the best resource to deal with a situation like this? Because we don't have control over finding shelter for her. We don't have the ability to get her food. We don't have the, there's, there's so many other things. So how can we bring community partners together to respond to this? Mm -hmm. So if a call comes in and a, and, and, uh, you know, a woman says that she's been raped, would you then call circle? to and and so you know an advocate and the police would respond i guess that's where i'm not clear with you know. so for, for, for something for something of that nature law enforcement would definitely be involved we would we would come out to the scene we would do an investigation we would try to identify who who the um the subject is um, but we again there we would also contact the hospitals we would work with the emergency room to have uh, sane trained nurses to to um, uh, to go throughout uh, the procedures and trying to gather evidence mm -hmm. um, while, while the victim is, is is getting medical attention and then there's also a component in which we would reach out to other communities based groups and organizations we would reach out to Susan to let her know and then try to get community resources together to try to minimize as much of the trauma. But we have an obligation and our response is to find out who did it and to bring that person, conduct an investigation to bring that person to justice. I, I guess I have a lot of questions, but I don't want us to take up all this airtime. So I'm wondering if someone else has other questions. When you say Susan, it's not the Susan that's on this call, is it? <laughs> Actually, yes, it is. I didn't want to. I didn't want to <laughs> ping her out, but I see she just uh, took off her mute. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I muted myself to say hello. I am zooming from home, and there's some intermittent background noise. So, oh, okay. I'm trying to to keep that as a minimum distraction. But hi, everyone. I am the Susan that. Uh, that Chief Pete was referring to and um, really enjoy working with the Montpelier department, very impressed by them and glad to be here. Um, I have some knowledge of CIT and you know, it's a really, it's a really strong program. I really like the way it draws from um, both knowledge in the field of mental health, but also people's lived experience, family, I think that's a really important component. Mm -hmm. So I can jump in if or as wanted or needed, but um, yes, that's me and hello everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see faces, so this is a little bizarre. <laughs> I'm the only <laughs> one with a face on the screen. Um, uh, Bogdan, is that your, how you pronounce your first name? That is correct. Okay, I, I wasn't sure if you had questions also. Um, no, I, I just want to, to see what's going on and I already asked what I had, thank you. Okay, I guess again, uh, it's not clear to me, like are you, so like with the rape situation, I can see it's the police going out because really there's a crime that's occurred. Uh, if it's a mental health, issue it does that mean that the police may respond and susan would also i mean are they both physically at the site or is most of this done by you know the telephone or i guess it's not clear to me i mean i i'm sort of envisioning three or four people <laughs> uh at the scene and i don't know if that's accurate or what does it really look like so it, it was and the answer to that one is it depends there's so many different factors that relate into that um so i think what you what you might be alluding to in in, in a lot of areas it's called a mobile crisis response team um and and so that crisis response team is made up of peers a mental health professional uh law enforcement in some cases some cases that uh you know depending on the wants and the needs of the community or the resources of everyone involved, there may not be, be a police officer responding to 
of that type of a situation. Um, but but in my last assignment in Alamogordo, we created a mobile response crisis team, and that consists of peers of an, an, um, a law enforcement officer who was not in uniform, who was wearing plain clothes, unmarked cars, a mental health service uh, professional, and uh, that was because our community resources in Alamogordo were not that robust. We didn't have um, we didn't have like what we do here with Washington County Mental Health Services. We didn't have uh, a lot of uh, grassroots organizations and community resources that could respond with such a model so that law enforcement took it upon itself to try to facilitate all the resources together and bring them together and how we responded. Um, so so it, it depends. The answer to that one is it depends. And, and it would depend on, again, what, the, what resources we have available. So it, going back to the sexual assault example that you brought up, the police would probably be a primary call on that because we're working to, to gather evidence and to try to find out what happened, but we're doing it in a very trauma-informed way. We're not jumping in and, you know, I'm detective so-and-so, just the facts, ma'am. It's, it's, it's more of an empathetic, very trauma-informed way um, to, that we would also work to, to establish relationships with community partners, such as the folks who do respond to um, sexual assault cases and, and the volunteers in those organizations. So we build up those re or we build up those relationships outside of work so that when we need to, when we unfortunately, when we find ourselves working together because of a call, that we're all on the same sheet of music. And those are already strong relationships that we have in place. And we just have to make sure that we maintain them and keep them stronger. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm, I, I don't know exactly what happened in that incident a couple of years ago in Montpelier, where uh, I think the person involved was known to organizations and the police and the community that he had mental health issues. So when an individual already is known, do, will the dispatcher automatically, let's say, call Susan? Um, well, well, potentially in, in that particular situation, I wasn't here when it happened and, and, uh, and I wasn't on scene. So I'll, I'll try to stay general to what I understand that did happen, but, um, that, yeah, it, it, yeah, the gentleman was known to the Montpelier police department, to law enforcement in the area, um, as somebody who may have, who was dealing with, who has mental health crisis issues, but in the past, you know, somebody who, who is suffering from mental health crisis, you, you never know when that, what's going to happen, how, how they're going to react to whatever specific trigger or incident that they have. And so one day we may respond to somebody who we know has a, a, a has an illness, a mental health related illness and everything is fine. We're able to have conversations, we're able to interact. Um, but then the next day, the, the situation, the, the, the person may be more emotional. The person may be going through more of a traumatic illness um, in which that we're unable to have conversations. And that's not just with the police. That's within, within any other situation. So, you know, there have been times that mental health service professionals were dealing with clientele and they are forced to call the police mm -hmm. because they're unable to eat and they're trained. They're go, they've go to, gone to school and everything to that effect. So, so there's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of, I think, misnomer or misconception or assumptions that uh, that some folks in the public may believe oh throw the social worker at it and then everything's going to be great well the social workers are overworked they're underpaid and and and, and they're yeah, and as good as they are as much as i love them and respect them they they can't be superman or superwoman and so we want to make sure that we don't place unrealistic expectations on folks who are in the mental health uh field but in, in that past incident there was a weapon that was reported to have been involved. So no, no social service, uh, social service worker or mental health professional is going to respond to a situation like that. And if they do, they're going to stay in the background. They're not going to come onto a scene where it's unsafe for them. So law, it's up to law enforcement to try to deescalate the situation and to resolve it, to turn it over. So in, in that situation, there was a weapon that was reported to have been involved, and it was an unfortunate outcome of what happened. But one day, somebody who's suffering from mental illness may be fine and okay and responsive. 
the next day the situation may not be like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I, I sort of figured that things are sort of fluid because you never know, even by minute by minute, even within the same call, right? <laughs> uh, so what you're, again, so is it up to the dispatcher to make the initial assessment and then they would call whoever they felt needed to respond and that like would susan go to the site without police ever? Um, well currently we don't necessarily have that model set up we're still trying to figure it out if susan if you'd like to jump on the call but also keeping in mind susan's not 24 7. right susan right. may only have work hours and the work hours may be related to based on the resources that are available in the community. So if everybody else is working nine to five and that's the best time for Susan to connect with people to, to gather or to get folks the resources that they need, Susan's hours are probably going to be in that time frame. But a lot of times these crises don't occur when Susan's around or when she's on the clock. So that's mm -hmm. why it's important that law enforcement is also given some type of robust training in dealing with mental illness and de-escalation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, that's, I mean, there isn't that 24 seven coverage, and I don't want to micromanage and I don't know what the best <laughs> uh, way to uh, schedule this, but I'm thinking that mental health, other than the week, well, even on the weekends, there may be emergency mental health workers. And so, I guess, um, I guess there's mental health crisis workers 24 seven. Is that correct, Susan? Um, so Washington County Mental Health has um, crisis staffing 24 um, seven. There are two people on any given shift um, who are answering calls and then sometimes there's a backup third person. Um, so that's been in place you know, for years and years. And many calls do go, in fact, directly to Washington County Mental Health about mental health crisis and don't come to the police department. Mm -hmm. When a call comes to the police department, oftentimes that's because um, things have reached a level where safety is a really legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. And so um, the smallest percentage of my responding to scenes in either police department has been where I'm going alone. Because generally, if we're getting a call and it's coming through dispatch, um, you know, something with some risk involved is happening. Mm -hmm. And I will say I have worked, I'm relatively new to Vermont. I moved here from Massachusetts. And prior to this, I worked as a crisis clinician um, in an agency like Washington County Mental Health. And there were a number of calls as Chief Pete had alluded to um, about crisis clinicians and their limitations around the safety piece. There were a number of calls that ultimately what I was doing was calling the local police department and saying, you know, this person, there's a question that, uh, that they have a weapon. I can't go to this scene, will you please go? Hmm. So one of the things that I love about the model that Montpelier has and is further developing is that it really draws from the best of both law enforcement and mental health. It gets mental health in there, even when I'm not working, you know, oftentimes bringing in crisis clinicians from Washington County Mental Health. Um, it, it brings in the mental health component while attending to the safety piece. And I think that having those two things together in a, um, in a genuine mental health crisis is often very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I, again, I'm basing this on the assumption uh, that both mental health clinician and also the police department were responding 
at the, simultaneously. So I was trying to figure out what is the difference if that's a, if my thinking was accurate. How is that different from what the CIT is going to provide? I guess that's also another thing that wasn't clear to me. Um, so, so I think that what CIT has is is it, in in Montpelier in Washington County. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that implementing the CIT program is going to be, uh, and I don't want to jinx myself, but it, it's not, I don't think, a, heaviest, a heavier lift as it would be in other communities who will be starting from scratch. We've had rock star superstars, Gary, Mary Moulton, uh, I, you know, a lot of the, the grassroots organizations, volunteer organizations, churches and everything that have already got this, that, that, that have, you know, have these to have some type of resources in place to help people but what the CIT program does is it streamlines the response and standardizes the response it provides more robust training and then it we're not siloed we're talking mm -hmm. to each other and and so we can so if there's something going on and again this is this is happening already but you know if, if you you know we're, we're building a more robust relationship so mm -hmm. so that's what that response model looks like and then and then like like as Susan had had uh, had said that there's two Washington or there there's two screeners from Washington County, but th there are two for the entire county. So there may be something going on in Berlin or Barrytown, and then something happens in Barry City, and you know so so it's so they're, they're, they're they've got a lot on their plate and a lot that they're doing, right. and uh, and so it, it's it's how do we how do we spread the uh, the, the bandwidth out that all of us can try to help carry that. Um, and then again, that, that, that's what the CIT thing would do is we, we bring each other together, we find out what we're best at, what we need a little bit of more work and resources for, and then we develop a response model based on, uh, I think what we can get, um, you know, the more benefit for the, for the, uh, the, the resources we have in the county. Mm -hmm. So at one time I lived in Caledonia County and I worked as a victim advocate for umbrella and uh i guess and the police i mean we really and this was back in the early 80s so we were still doing a lot of training around domestic violence uh to organizations and agencies so one of the concerns and this may be really far-fetched and please correct me if i'm really sort of worrying about something that's not going to happen but I said so I'm concerned about what if an agency gets a call and from everything that they hear they're saying well that's not an appropriate response for us and so it gets turned over to someone else and you know what do you see that ever happening and what kind of safety guards are going to be in place so that that doesn't happen. No, I, I get it. it. It's like, you know, you call somebody, that's not my responsibility, my job. And then who's going to be, who's standing there when the music stops? Right. And, and, and unfortunately, that, that, I, I, it doesn't purposely happen, but sometimes it happens, uh, even now. But I think what, what the, and, and ultimately it's going to be incumbent upon the police to, to it's always been the, the police will be the ones who are going to, you know, to do that um, and to respond to certain situations if someone's not open, if they don't have, if, if a volunteer is not available. So it's going to be a law enforcement response and trying to trying to work through that. But I think the good news is, and I'm not saying that generally, I'm not saying that for Montpelier or Washington County, I'm saying that in general. Um, but I think what the good news is, is that there's strong relationships here in our county and in our city that minimize those things happening and then when you have then when you have um um a, a cit program in which folks are talking with each other we're having meetings with each other on, on a more routine basis we're friends with each other we know each other um those types of we can build those bonds and those relationships so that we don't have something that you know something that would slip through the cracks if you will that there will be a gap in those types of resources and response. So, so the, the, the model would be the CIT steering committee, 
facilitates everything. If we find that there's something that we need to do better because something happened in the field, whether the police did something we weren't supposed to, and that affected the ER or that affected Washington County Mental Health Services or um, uh, Circle or uh, you know I I anyone, then the CI, uh, the, then the steering committee will facilitate. You guys did this wrong. Let's look at the process. How do we improve and strengthen it? And how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? Mm -hmm. So it's a clearinghouse. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, Brian, you and I have had several conversations because we had talked about the possibility of doing a training around LGBTQ uh, yes. issues. And so I have the utmost respect for, you know, the way people do business. I, you know, um, I guess. I'm seeing more and more and before I was retired, I just felt like people were working more and more in silos and determined. So people's roles and responsibilities were so narrow that, you know, by the time I would get a call, sometimes I say, oh, I've already made like six calls. Somebody, you know, everybody's always telling me, oh, they can't help me, you know? And so that's what I'm concerned about, that as we do, as we become more specialized, that people are not always going to be reaching the people that they need to reach. And so I'm concerned about someone being left out there without getting the proper response and care that they need. No, I, I agree with you. and and. And I feel the same way. And and there's, we we work on that whole premise that if that's my, I'm not going to treat anybody the way you know that I wouldn't treat my own family. Mm. And 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 that's how we 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 want to approach this. And then when we when we do things like sim mapping, um, and we identify the areas where we don't have resources, like like say for example, um, what if you have somebody who's in a crisis situation, but they're not they're not in in such of a situation or such a condition that they need to go to the er yeah where yeah. can we send that person and, and say if something happened at home that triggered them somebody at home said it did something that made them upset you know what's the cooling off period what's the resources what are the peers they can talk to or who are the peers they can talk to to come down they don't need to go to the er we don't need to back up the resources at the hospital we don't want to traumatize people by going to the er because a lot of folks when they go to the er it's a it's a very traumatic experience so how do we avoid that how do we avoid that, that the police aren't being called um and and so maybe one of the answers is trying to find like a midway point that we have like a in one of the one of the areas one of the the working groups I've been in about a month ago, they have a system that they call it a, a peer rescue. And it's, it's like, a, it's just like a, a, a unassuming building, a home, and you don't need to go to the ER. Why don't we go here? And there are peers that will come pick them up. And why don't we go here? Why don't we talk about it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and those types of situations and incidences. So, so when we do SIM mapping, when we identify these gaps in services, so, how, so nobody's left stranded. Who is the person we call when this happens? And, and how are we gonna guarantee that that person or that organization or that police department is going to respond? That's what we're trying to make sure that we shore up any gaps or cracks. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is exciting because, you know, I, when you, I've seen CIT come up in uh, more, uh, in the media more. And so I remember you mentioning it when you first started or first moved here to Vermont. And so I see that a lot, it's being utilized, you know, nationwide. I mean, I can't say nationwide, but I certainly have seen it, uh, you know, being used by other uh, departments around the country. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it. It's, a, it's an outstanding model, I think, and we're just working to do it. And I was just so grateful that when I mentioned it to, to other folks in the area, everybody, there was no hesitation. Mm -hmm. Everybody was ready to get on it. And, and yeah. so I, I think we're very lucky and fortunate. Yeah, yeah. And we live in a very rural region of Vermont. Well, Vermont's pretty rural, uh, but... <laughs> You know, so you have you can get a call that's out in Worcester, which I think is still Washington County, um, and then another call, you know, at the other end. 
So it's, it's, I'm sure it's challenging. Yeah, there are always challenges, but I think, you know, some, what we're trying to do is a good cause. I think what everyone who is, who is doing this, who is in, in, in service to the public and in their communities, and um, there's, there's no challenge too great that we can't overcome. So I'm, I'm very confident this is going to be something that you're going to see uh, come to life within the next three months. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we'll just get stronger and stronger and stronger as we continue on. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure, you know, talk about popular culture, uh, you know, with this uh, Chauvin case being aired on TV, people are learning a lot more around what's fictional and what's real uh, regarding police response. So I think you know, it's only one department, but I, I think people may be learning a whole lot and opening their eyes to things that they didn't even understand or didn't even know. Um, so I think it's an exciting time that you're introducing this and I'm very, also very hopeful about it. And I appreciate your coming in and not waiting a year to assess the situation here in uh, Washington County and, and moving forward. No, I, I appreciate that. And, and it's definitely, I'm, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants um, and people who have, who have been trying to, to implement these things and little by little based on the resources that they've had to work with. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm just a wheel in that and a cog in that wheel. And, and, and I'm just very fortunate to be here with the people that folks like you, people who are concerned about the community and are pushing us to do better. Um, I, it's been a blessing. Um, it's been a wonderful experience to, to, be, to be with people who are committed to doing their trade. And so it's, it's definitely them, not me. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're very humble. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't have any more question at this point. Uh, you know, I'm just a little disappointed that we don't have more people uh, on this call, but it's also a beautiful spring day after <laughs> all it seems like a very gloomy winter, winter. <laughs> uh, you know, in more ways than one. So I hope that you had more participants in your other calls. Um, and that people just don't become critical after the fact when they've had these opportunities. So I, I appreciate your, op your being willing uh, and forward thinking and trying to get the community involved and uh, you know more knowledgeable about what you're trying to do. Cause I think it's a, a wonderful way uh, to, and we're, we're dealing with right now, at least in Montpelier, a somewhat divided community over other issues that have nothing to do with law enforcement. So I have concerns about the tone and how that's going to you know, impact the police department uh, because I know the budget became a real issue and sticking point. So you've got your work laid out for you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you, and I, I appreciate that, but we're going to, it's incumbent upon us to, to get out there and to try to regain trust, and, and that's what we're going to do, and I'm very confident in the, in the people I work for in this department, and I know we're going to get there, and uh, we'll all be hopefully stronger and more informed with each other for it. So thank you, Rachel. I appreciate that. Okay. Susan, it was nice to, to meet you, or somewhat, <laughs> virtually at least. And uh, good luck, both of you. Uh, and if there's anything, I mean, I can't imagine what I could do, but you know, if you need a community member, uh, I have a little bit of experience around crisis intervention. Um, you know, I'm here. Thank you, Rachel. Okay. Thank well, you. It was, it was really nice to meet you as well. Okay, well, try to get out there. It's beautiful. You too. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.